interesting. I want to talk a little bit about feed water tanks. So I want to just talk a little bit about the two different types and, and just let you run. Sure. So uh, what we've got here is a full on deaerator. Um, a lot of times you'll hear people abbreviate it and just call it a DA. Um, over there is a small condensate tank or a preheated feed water system. Sometimes they'll even call it an atmospheric uh, feed water system. Um, but basically both of these are performing two functions. Uh, one, we are trying to preheat water. And the second that we're trying to do is actually drive excess oxygen out of that water. So you might think I've got a boiler. Why do I need something else to go with it? Right. Um, I don't know if you've ever taken a really hot pan and thrown it in water, but it typically warps and then it wobbles on the stove. Uh -huh. And so metal warps when you throw cold water against hot metal. Boilers are no different. And actually it's a lot more amplified than that. When you throw so much heat in a boiler and then you throw cold water in there, you can warp it. In this case, you can pull tubes out, you can warp the tube sheet, you can do a lot of damage. So we need to preheat that water before we send it into the boiler so that it will actually be warm enough that when it goes in there, it doesn't allow that kind of thermal uh, shock to occur. Yeah. Um, what, also, are the, what are the temperatures real quick? Sure. Yeah. So on a deaerator, typically you're going to operate them at a minimum of five pounds uh, or PSI. Okay. And so those will actually operate around 227 degrees or more. Okay. Um, on a condensate tank, you're going to be looking at more 180 degrees and above. Okay. Um, okay. Usually you won't run them too much higher than that because you could cavitate your pumps, but that goes into pump design and all of that can be avoided later. Right. So you've got the higher temperature, you've got the pressure. Yep. Why? Okay, so it goes into a little bit of how these actually work. So a deaerator is a lot more complex. Basically, with a deaerator, what you're going to do is you've got a pressurized system, and inside we are mechanically scrubbing the water. We are heating things up with steam, so we're running steam back from the boiler, sipping a little bit of that off. We're putting the steam in the inside this uh, deaerator tank, and we're going to be using it in a number of mechanical ways to heat up the water. Basically, you're making a, ba a bath of vapor and you're putting water droplets into that vapor to heat it up. Mm -hmm. And so there's a couple different designs. Some will actually spray water through little jets into the steam vapor. Mm -hmm. Some of them blast it against uh, baffles. Some of them even have trays that cascade the water down these trays and break them out into smaller droplets. But one way or another, you're heating up the water a lot more like that. Mm -hmm. um, whereas with a small condensate tank or preheated feed water system, you're actually going to be just running a sparge tube in the bottom. It's okay. basically a pipe that has a whole bunch of little holes in it. Uh -huh. We're running steam through there, blasting the steam up under the water and heating it up that way. Uh -huh. And somehow we're, uh, we're also using a little bit of that mechanical force of that driving steam up to get a little bit of the oxygen out. So okay. that's the second part of it. We're heating it up and we're trying to drive as much oxygen out as we can. But no pressure in Correct. The tank. They're yeah, completely obviously. vented, atmospheric. You don't have any pressure on them. They're okay. completely open. Okay. Um, one thing that we do see too with these is that when we go through and we start, you know, going through and driving up the temperature and driving out all that oxygen, um, we're protecting the boiler from oxygen pitting. That's the reason we want that oxygen out of there. We don't yeah. want oxygen pitting on our steel and the more oxygen you can get out, the better. These deaerators, they get a lot more oxygen out of the water. Whereas the condensate tanks, they get some out, but they're not quite as efficient. They're yeah. just not as, they're a lot simpler. They're not as complex and they don't do as good a job of getting all of that oxygen. Okay. Out. So oxygen is supposed to come out. So yeah. now what do you do here if you're not getting it all out? Usually you're gonna to have to add a little bit more chemical treatment to your system. Okay. Um, typically what you'll do is you'll use an oxygen scavenging agent, some kind of chemical, whether it's a, uh, a sulfite or something along those means to actually try to get more of that oxygen out of there. Mm -hmm. You'll still have to use that with a deaerator. You can't avoid your chemical treatment just because you've got this, but this helps get even more out of it and it'll keep your, your units healthier for a lot longer time. Right. Um, the boiler will last a lot longer. Um, the main difference in these applications, usually we won't see these atmospheric feed water systems unless it's a relatively small boiler. Okay. Typically under 300 horsepower is kind of a general rule of thumb, but usually when it's less than that, that's where we'll see those smaller, um, less critical applications. Um, but usually if you're gonna have a bigger boiler, if you're gonna be running at a higher pressure, if you're gonna be running the boiler really hard, a deaerator is really gonna be a better solution for you. Sure. Um, we do see that those atmospheric systems, uh, those preheated feed water systems are a lot cheaper. Yeah. Um, they're not gonna cost near as much as a deaerator system. Um, and also they won't have as many things to worry about as far as maintenance. They don't have as many parts to fail and they don't need inspections as regularly as far as required state inspections. Yeah. Most DAs you've gotta go ahead and inspect every couple of years. Uh, some states even require that you do a mag particle test of the metal strength every so often. Right. So if you've got a small boiler and you don't have those kind of concerns and don't really want to go through and make that kind of expense, maybe a cheaper option would be better. Yeah, yeah, now Alex is in our rental department and uh, pretty much in the rental department, you guys 
choose the aerators mm -hmm. for every uh, trailer, the sizes and everything, correct? Yep, for all of our large boilers, a de is yeah. the way to go. It's, yeah. it's had a lot more success, it protects our boilers better. And overall, you also get some efficiency gains by putting higher temperature water into the boiler. Mm -hmm. We get to keep a little bit more efficiency and do better for our customers. Okay. We're gonna talk about isolating feed water to a boiler. There are times when we wanna do that, the boiler's off completely, but when we're in standby, sometimes we will close a manual water valve um, in the feed water line. And one reason for that is the type of feed water valve that we have. Um, this is a Ware V-Port ball valve, but because it's a ball valve style, fundamentally, that means that we get 100% shut off with this valve. And that means that if this boiler's in standby, we don't necessarily have to isolate a manual valve to prevent water from going in. But many valve feed water styles don't have a 100% shutoff rating. And the reason is that they don't need it if the boiler's online. But you will notice when you've shut that boiler down that the water creeps up in the sight glass and the boiler eventually is flooded. We want to prevent that, and that's why we would use a manual isolating valve. So whether or not you need to isolate the boiler is pretty much gonna depend on the type of valve that you have. Thank you. We're gonna talk about one of the details of modulating feed water. When we've got a modulating feed water valve, what we're gonna see is it react proportionally to the water level in the boiler. And upstream of the modulating feed water valve, we've got the discharge pressure from our pump. So at a minimum demand, when this valve is mostly closed, we'll approach the maximum possible pressure on the outlet of that pump. So in this case, we've actually got a recirculation line at the pump to ensure some flow, even though this is closed. As this valve opens up, we've got more flow and the pressure coming to the modulating valve is actually going to drop because of line losses between the pump and here and because that flow is increasing. So this pressure is going to vary according to the valve position. If we want a more constant pressure there, we could add a pressure transmitter and a frequency drive on the pump. In that case, we'd be able to accelerate or decelerate the pump according to this demand. And on a installation where we've just got one boiler, one pump, with modulating feed control, with a VFD, we may not even need this valve. We can simply throttle the pump up and down. But in sites where we've got multiple boilers pulling off the same pump, we're generally going to either run that pump at a constant speed or modulate it based on a certain pressure outlet. I want to talk a little bit about feed water tanks. On a simple system, we may have a feed water tank, not a de-aerator, um, where we're pumping water into the boiler but we've got to make water up into that tank. So a common method for doing that is using a trough valve. Um, it's simple, readily available, basically works like the valve in your toilet. Uh, level comes up, it shuts off. It's not complicated, it's easy to replace. But we do run into problems with them sometimes. I'm gonna talk about two different things that we'll run into. The first one, you know, if your tank's overfilling, you may have to remove and inspect that float valve. It could have garbage in it, or like our model here, could have rusted through, have a hole in it. Obviously, it's not gonna float like that. You're gonna overfill. But a less common or overlooked reason that tanks can overfill is because of the incoming pressure. This trough valve has a half-inch valve seat. So if we look at that diameter divided in half, pi r squared gives us 0.2 square inches of surface area, our water pressure could cause us to overfill. So if we've got a modest water pressure going to that float valve, it only takes a pound of force to close it off. But if I've got a feed tank being supplied by 25 pounds or even 80 PSI, 
um, it may take 16 pounds of force to shut this off. So what we'll find is that we may overfill or not, depending on fluctuations in city or plant pressure. Um, so the solution to that is a pressure reducing valve. So anytime you've got a float or trough valve on a feed tank, it's really important if you have any water pressure at all to reduce that pressure down so the float can do its job. <laughs> Yeah, then, then I'll do it. Then it could be weak.